Okay, uh, if we can begin. Uh, today we have a very special lecture. I'm very pleased to introduce Carl Icahn as our lecturer. Uh, Mr. Icahn has a career that is really uh, uh, relevant to some of the topics we've talked about in this course. Uh, one theme we've talked about in this course is corporate democracy. And we've talked about a book written by Burl and Means, who said that shareholders are so dispersed that they uh, have really no control over a company, and boards of directors are self perpetuating. Well, Carl Icahn has made a career of, uh, of really opposing that tendency in American business. Uh, Carl Icahn graduated from Princeton University pre med in 1957. Uh, in 1968, he founded Icon and Company, uh, and this company, Icon and Company, has taken substantial shareholder positions in a number of major corporations, including RJR Nabisco, TWA, Texaco, Phillips Petroleum, Time Warner, uh, Motorola, uh, and when uh, Icon and Company takes a position in a company, it then becomes active in the management of this company and in changing the way they do business, and uh, uh, they've done this with enormous success. So, uh, Carl, I, I'm very pleased that you could come and do this today. Good to see you, Bob. Uh, it would be really nice if you could give some clues to our students here who are themselves launching out on careers of uh, how you got started in this and what your philosophy is and what you would recommend to them. The career you're asking about, I, I went down to Wall Street back in, way back in the 60s, and I thought I was really, uh, I had gone to Princeton, a really good school, <laughs> <Okay>. and, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I had gotten in there from a tough high school. I was the uh, first to go from my high school. Nobody believed I, uh, they, they never took an Ivy League, uh, the Ivy League never took anybody from this school I went to, but uh, any, anyway, I went, got in and uh, left there, and I thought I was a real smart guy, cut it short. Went down to Wall Street and uh, worked for Jack Dreyfus, and I was playing the market in 1961. That shows how old. And uh, in, a, in a bull market, you make a great deal of money by doing leverage. It's a little bit like today with all the leverage that we had, and now might be coming uh, 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 to fruition. But uh, I was I was borrowing money and bought all these convertibles, and I thought I was a genius. And Jack Driver said, you're going to lose all your money. I had made a few bucks playing poker, and that's how I started with about eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And I made all this money by borrowing at 90%. And I would go out, and I was making a lot more in, in, in two weeks than my father made in two years. And uh, my father said, well, you know, put the money away. I said, no, Dad, and I'm going to really make a fortune here. I went out, I remember once, and bought a Galaxy convertible then. It was a beautiful car. I had a beautiful girlfriend. It was a model. It was just pretty nice. But uh, but uh, uh, what happened, the crash came in 1962. I was wiped out in one day. I didn't even have the poker winnings left. And I tell you, I can't recall if the car left first or the girl left first. But it was pretty, it was pretty close. Maybe the same day. Maybe the same day, actually. And uh, after that, I learned you have to learn something. And uh, I became an expert in options. And um, after that, I built a following and built a big uh, a, a big following and, and a big commission base by uh, just learning one area very well. Probably I knew that area better than almost anyone on Wall Street. Uh, not to sound too presumptuous, but very few people knew it, so it doesn't mean very much. But in any event, <clears throat> we built up a big following in 68, bought the seat on the stock exchange with the help of uh, one of my uncles, and uh, by that time I had saved a pretty big amount of money for those days. And then uh, I got into arbitrage, but not merger, bonafide, and that's something else you can learn, where you can, uh, where you can do it. You still do it today, but it's much tougher with all these computers, so I don't do it. Because I don't understand the computers; they're beyond me. So uh, I don't I don't work uh, uh, with them too well. I being a little facetious, but not too facetious. So 
you, you could buy different convertible bonds and short the stocks against them. You had no risk, but you could make a lot of money, and eventually we did real well with that. And what I do today still is pretty much the same idea. You buy stocks in a company that is cheap, and, and you look at the asset value of the companies that you buy the stocks in, and it becomes a little more complex. But basically, you look for the reason that they're, they're, they're really cheap. And the major reason is often and usually uh, very poor management. So in a sense, it's a, like an arbitrage. You go in, you buy a lot of stock in the company, and you uh, then try to make changes at the company. Today, if you read the newspapers tomorrow, you'll read, a, we're trying to do the same thing at Motorola. And if you bother to read the Wall Street Journal tomorrow, or, maybe the Times, I don't know, you, you'll see a little bit of what we're trying to do there. We're trying to get them to change the structure of the company. We think the board is very is a very poor board there, and uh, we're trying to change what, what happens. The, 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 the thing about corporate America, a few people that go to college that where you are now and, and, and most people in America don't realize how, how poorly most of our companies are run in this country, uh, with many exceptions. They're, they're really very poor. And when you get inside the companies, you realize it. And, and the, the real reason is there's no accountability. There's no corporate democracy. And I've been saying that, proselytizing it, writing about it. And the reason that we can make so much money when we go into one of these is I'm not even a manager. I never took a course in management, and uh, uh, I wouldn't profess to really know much, but I don't micromanage. I put in a very good manager. They cut the heck out of a course, but they changed the structure of the company. And this is the problem in America today, in my opinion, that we are basically undermanaged. We can't compete because the best and the brightest don't get to be at the top of the corporate ladder. And I, I have a sort of a metaphor that's a little facetious, but not completely, about it. I call it anti-Darwinian. It's anti-Darwinian in, in America's corporations. And that means a guy goes to college, and um, he, this, is the, this is the guy that gets to be the CEO. And he, he's in college, and he's the kind of guy that you know, was the president of the fraternity. Now, all these presidents of fraternities aren't bad guys, but basically, the normal guy that I remember in college was, he's always there at the fraternity of the eating club, and he's always there to be there. If you have a bad day, you walk over to the club, and you're feeling bad, your girlfriend left you, you did bad on a test score or whatever, and you go over there, he's always there. He buys you a drink, and you sit around with him. He commiserates with you. You play a little pool or whatever, and he tells you whatever it is. Yeah, my girl left me. Yeah, well, they're all no good. Usual conversation back and forth, and what would happen would be you like the guy. You can't help but like him. You used to wonder a little bit, when the hell did he ever do any work? But, you know, he was always there for you. And... He never made many waves. He never said anything too obtrusive, or he never showed too much intelligence, but he was a good guy. He goes, that same guy goes out into corporate America, and he, he politically, he's astute. He knows how to get along with people. And it's, it's, he, he never really rocks the boat. He, he never uh, comes up with any great idea. He's not a threat to his superior. And as a result, he moves up the ladder because we, because they're really, in, in corporate America, there's really very little accountability. And what happens in corporate America, he moves up that ladder. There's a good show, How to Succeed in Business, that was out many years ago that sort of <laughs> sums it up. You know, if you say... Uh, if a genius has an idea in corporate America, if the genius has an idea... The next idea is they give him an idea to resign. And, and, and so he moves along the ladder, and he gets, to the, and he gets up slowly up to the top. Now, he has two, he has two uh, attributes. He's uh, likable, he's politically astute, and he's a survivor, and he knows when he's threatened. 
and he gets to the top. And this is the attributes of today's CEOs, for the most part, with exceptions. So, you know, he doesn't ruffle feathers. He doesn't get the board upset. And as he moves up the ladder, he finally gets to be number two to the CEO. Now, the CEO is the same uh, same attributes, where he doesn't want to be threatened and he's survivor. So the CEO will never let anybody be number two who's smarter than he is. So by definition, this, the assistant of the CEO is a little dumber than the CEO. Now, this, this guy now is the assistant. The board likes him. The CEO eventually retires, and they make this guy the CEO, the fraternity president we're talking about. Now, he's, the, he's now the, the head guy, the CEO. Now, he'll bring in a number two guy that's a little dumber than he is because he doesn't want to be threatened. So by definition, we'll be run by morons pretty soon. And we're not too far from that right now, from that, from that point in, in, in our economic history. And, and so this is a problem that we have. Now, we've been able to do okay in this country and pretty well, even with the fact that we're badly managed. Because over the last 20 years, we've had a pretty free, free ride. We've gotten from all over the world, the whole global economy has been booming, and we've been able to get cheap goods. And these cheap goods kept us from having inflation. So very simply put, if you don't have inflation, it's easy for the Federal Reserve to keep pumping money into an economy. So they, so money kept flowing. You, you were sort of at a punch bowl. The country was at a party. And we kept drinking from this punch bowl, enjoying ourselves, and the rest of the world would take our dollars. They would take our dollars because everybody thought, oh, America, you know, it's great. It's a little bit like you came from some town, you know, and, and, and there's one family in the town that, you know, doesn't do much work, sort of profligates, rely around the pool, have fun, partying a lot have the big cars and have the, the good times and the rest of the town works hard, you know, in the farms or wherever they are. And they keep bringing stuff to this rich family's estate. You know, they give them whatever they want. They give them food. They give them clothing. But, you know, anything in the, the rich family just gives them IOUs. And they keep taking the IOUs. So the rich family doesn't do anything. Just fly around the pool and have fun and travel or whatever. And they're, everybody's working. Well, one day, a few of these people are going to say, I don't want your IOUs anymore. You know, what the hell am I going to take your IOUs? It's worthless because you, 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 you lost all your money. Well, our country, think about it, is a bit in that situation. We've been given our IOUs, which are dollar bills to the rest of the world, and taking their cheap goods. However, we're reaching a point now where the dollar, as you've been reading, if, you, if, you're, if you're attuned to it, the dollar is devaluating as we speak. And we got to... I believe, a real problem on our hands in the economy. The other thing we've done in the last five, ten years, and I know Bob Schiller has been talking to you about this, is housing. Housing is like tulip bulbs almost. They, they, they uh, you know, there was a big crisis in Holland in the 1600s on tulip bulbs, and I like reading about these crises. Because everybody bought, bought, bought tulip bulbs, thought it was the greatest. The one guy looks and says, hey, what the hell am I doing with this tulip bulb? And all of a sudden, he had a crisis. Well, and I'm not going to get into the depth of it, but our banks, because they wanted to make more and more money, and our investment bank, Wall Street, kept issuing different paper against mortgages. So it made it simple to give a mortgage. So these mortgages were given out to people that couldn't afford them. And today, you have what you call subprime uh, mortgages, subprime paper, they issued against this paper stuff called mortgage-backed securities. They securitized them. And these things are all floating around now. And there's maybe about $3 trillion worth of subprime and all-day mortgages out there. Well, as you've seen, these have produced crises of confidence. And I don't think we've heard the last of it. The government sort of bailed out the situation by having J.P. Morgan take over Bear Stearns. And we're, I'm not going to get in the depth of it here, but it's a real fascinating story. In any event, we have uh, uh, problems uh, 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 problems in, in our economy, and uh, I, I think that uh, we are going to 
see more of these problems in the next year or so. I think uh, Bob can talk to you more about what's going to happen in housing. But a lot of it depends on that. Because if, if you can't have your housing prices go back up, a lot of these pay, a lot of the people that bought them can't afford to pay the mortgages, nor will they want to. If they see the homes go down in value, they're gonna just say, oh, they're gonna walk away. Now, if that happens, these homes are the collateral for the banks for all these uh, uh, mortgages, and we're gonna have, and probably do have already, a recession, and that recession could become a lot more acute because. Today, uh, and I'm not, you know, going to go. I'm just going to open it for questions soon. But today, there is six trillion dollars more of debt in this economy that I believe it can't sustain, because everyone, went, the middle, the middle class, and the, went on a borrowing bench over the last few years to buy these homes and to buy for any, you know, with the credit cards and go buy anything they felt like buying, and as a result. I'm not certain that they can pay that six trillion back, but even if they can, they're not going to be willing to go buy. Uh, they're not going to be willing to go buy uh, 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 more things. So as you as you have that happening and you have an inflation, the earnings of our corporations will go down. And they estimate. I've talked to one or two very uh, good economists in the last few weeks. They estimate that earnings of the S&P averages will go down about 20% in the next year. Well, with that, the stock market is at a, I would say, a precipice. You don't know which way it's going to go. So with all that said, uh, you have to worry about, about all these things. And I know you're studying this and you're learning about it. But I think there will be great opportunities ahead for in, in, in the ability for Wall Street to, again, securitize and buy a lot of uh, a lot of these companies if you have capital you'll be able to buy these bonds so I do tell you that I think Wall Street is certainly a, a, a good area if you're thinking about a career I still think it's a very good area but I you know I'm not going to tell you if you love to write or you love to play the cello to go and come to Wall Street but but I do think it's a good career I think it, it, it makes sense I think that corporate America is learning from this, and I think we're going to make our top management much more accountable in the years ahead. There are tremendous abuses in corporate America today. Uh, uh, your CEO makes 400 times the, what the average worker makes, and he's just simply not worth it. And, and the reason you have this is that – you, you, you have no accountability that shareholders simply don't vote. They don't care about voting. And there's a whole reason for that. You, you have an intimacy relation with the owners of a lot of our stocks, which are the uh, mutual funds and institutions that don't like to vote against these managers. However, someone like myself and a few other activists do get a vote now, and we do get a proxy fight going. And we'll see, for instance, what happens in Motorola that we're doing as we speak. And I think that that will give an opportunity for young people like yourselves to get into uh, corporations in our country. And uh, uh, while I think Princeton is uh, might be a little better than Yale, I think Yale is a good school. And I think that all of you are are uh, are really uh, probably the top 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 of 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 the of the uh, of the uh, student bodies in this country and going ahead in your lives, I think that the corporations might be a good pl place to look, or, or Wall Street for that matter, because I think there's going to be a need for bright people. And, and I think that you'll be able to be rewarded for it in the fact that there will be accountability again. Well, that, well but I say again, there never really was accountability. So I think there will be a true, a true corporate democracy will have to evolve so that we can become competitive with the rest of the world again. So with that, I'll just basically, I think, Bob, just leave it open to questions and see if uh, anybody has any comments. Questions. 
Mr. Icon, you were mentioned in uh, 1962, you kind of blew up. Uh, after that uh, entire debacle ensued, uh, did, uh, how did you regain your confidence? And I guess most importantly, how did you regain or gain the confidence of uh, future investors? Well, you ask a few questions. I mean, how did you gain confidence? I, I don't think I ever lost confidence in my ability to understand what was going on. I just learned that you had to really, uh, really work at something and understand it. And little by little, I mean, it was sort of interesting. I'm a sort of a obsessive guy, and I work real hard all my life. You know, I, I really get into something, and I really delve into it. And what I came up with was uh, a letter there at that time to people who sold these options. They were wealthy people across the country. It was sort of interesting. Then it's not around today. But they would sell options, calls on a stock. So if you, so if the if, if you're a, a, a someone who traded the market, you'd like to buy an option on X Y Z stock, and wealthier people across the country would sell these options. Would give you the right. Today you have the CBOE. You know it's much more computerized. But then you would do it with these you know, over-the-counter transactions and. I was really one of the first to come in and say to people across the country, rather than do it with your broker, who doesn't really understand this business, rather than sell it, sell it with my, with me. I was a broker. It was just sell it with me. And little by little, people actually answered my ads. I would put it out an ad and say, get to, get to see what the true prices are and what the real value should be for that option that you're selling through Merrill Lynch, you're selling with Bates in those days or whoever. And we, I'd get letters from all over the country. Literally, I'd stay down on Wall Street till midnight calling people in California that would write in for this, uh, for this letter. And we built up a big following because I was really, uh, the risk of being modest, the only real honest guy in that business. Because everybody, I mean, not that they were dishonest, but, you know, the brokers didn't care and they'd get business back from who you sell it to. I'm not saying they did anything, you know, criminal or anything, but... Nobody really cared to get the right price for these people. And, and, and so by getting them the right price, they would stay with me as customers for years and years. So we, we uh, uh, you know, built it up and built it up. And then I got one assistant, then I got another assistant, and I, and I kept, uh, and, and I kept uh, moving up the ladder. But it took a lot of hard work and perseverance. And that's really where it went to from there with arbitrage and now what I do. What was the second part of your question? I forgot. How did you regain confidence in your investors and people who gave money to you? Uh, and did you feel uh, confident that you could give, get them to give you money after you had uh, kind of washed yourself out? Well, no, I told you that, that we, we had that letter and that we were able to, uh, we, were, we were able to, after the letter, have the, uh, I don't know if you heard me because I, I was sort of telling you that we, uh, we, we we put the letter out and we just gave them a good uh, good thing. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Hi, Mr. Icon. How are you? Hi. I'm Mark Otter. How are you? <laughs> um, I actually good have like three questions for you, but um, I'll start with the first one. I watched the 60-minute special on you recently, and they try to portray that there had been kind of an evolution in your career. Uh, they showed some bad press from the 80s with the TWA deal, and then they showed some good press recently with the so-called Icon Uplift and some of the political, I mean the um, uh, corporate activism that you've been engaged in. And in that interview, you sort of insisted that you hadn't changed at all. And I was just curious if you had changed and you didn't want to tell the reporter, or if uh, the media was giving you a bad rap. I can't hear the whole question, but 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 I haven't changed. I, I haven't changed at all. <laughs> all <right. laughs> they 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 call me a, they call me a raider. They call you an activist. You know, I mean, I haven't really. Uh, I think what we do though is very uh, is very uh, helpful to all investors. I mean, I think that's the point because when we get into the company, the stock goes up for everybody, so it really works out. But. Uh, but I've never changed uh, what I do. Okay. 
Uh, actually, I had two more questions. Um, the second question was about China, and there was a special report in the recent Economist talking about the uh, ravenous appetite that China has for natural resources right now. And I was curious what you thought the, the effect that would have on global financial markets and your investing strategy. Well, yeah, I mean, chi China is, uh, is, a, is a, a, a great buyer of, 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 the, of, of these uh, commodities. The trouble with this country is we don't, we don't have a lot of that. We don't have a lot of natural resources to sell them. And yet you question really what this country does. We make software. We make technology. We are innovative, but so are they. So what we really have to do is become a lot more productive, and we have to make our companies a lot more competitive. And today, I feel we're losing that edge. So while China is going to continue to uh, buy things, it doesn't mean they're going to buy them from us necessarily, even though the dollar has gone down a great deal. Thank you. Uh, this is my last question. Um, New York Times columnist David Brooks gave a, a great commencement speech last year at Wake Forest, and he said he was a, a journalist who led a boring life and observed interesting lives, uh, people like you. And I was curious, um, he mentioned that a lot of the great people they'd met, successful people, um, had lots of pictures of dead people on the walls. Uh, meaning that they had conversation. He said nearly famous people have pictures of themselves on the wall. Truly famous people have pictures of dead people on the walls. And I was curious if you had any pictures of great historical figures or what historical figures inspired you or influenced you on a regular basis. Uh, it's a good question. I, I uh, well, one, one of the greatest uh, philosophers I ever read was Aristotle. And I think his uh, Nicomachean ethics, if you read it, make a, a, great, a, a great deal of sense where you live with this golden mean but at the end, use your intellect. I mean, now you have to really read them in depth to understand what he's saying. And then, um, and then there's a poem by Roger Kipling I like, If, I'm sure a lot of you read it, you know. If you could keep your head about you and all the losing mares. I read that every once in a while. And uh, a, in, in the code that we follow, that's really important to be able to um, meet with triumph and disaster, you know, and not let either of those imposters uh, treat those imposters just the same. Meaning that if you're doing great, don't think you're a genius, and if you're doing badly, don't think the world comes to an end. And uh, if, if, you work hard, if you work hard, maybe it sounds trite, but if you work hard and uh, don't let your ego get ahead of you, which so many people do when you're doing well, and don't let yourself become too despondent if you're not doing well for a while, and have faith in your own ability, uh, and 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 really work hard at, at whatever you do. Give it everything you have. Well, if you can do all that, uh, I I think the chances are that you're going to hit a lucky streak because luck comes and goes. If you have your health, luck comes and goes. And uh, realize when you when you're doing really well that it's not just you. And then when you're not, it's not just you either. So I think that kind of thing. You should read that poem. I like the line where it's, if you can be in a crowd but not lose the common touch. That's my favorite That's line. That's right. It's a good one. That's right. If you can walk in a crowd and, and still not lose the, if you can walk with kings and not lose the common yeah, touch. Yeah, yeah okay. You know it. Yep. I've never walked with kings, though. <laughs> So I don't have to worry about losing the common touch because I'm not walking with King. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Icon. I have two questions. My first question is, to what extent can investors like us adopt your strategy of buying cheap and expecting the value of a company to go up? Well, I mean, that's, I, I don't consider that be a, necessarily a strategy. I think that uh, when you when you buy something, the best is the best is it sounds simple. It's not simple to buy it generally when everybody thinks you're wrong and if and, and the more people that think you're wrong the better you're going to do it in, in the in the long run that's 
how it works because at the end of the day, when everybody is against you, everybody sort of stalls, you know. So it, 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 it's very hard to do it psychologically, but at, at certain times you're in between and you're not going to get the benefit of that. But uh, it's the old grave and dog philosophy that, that you, you should just look at value. But one of the things is when people get given up on a company, that's the perfect time. But it, but it doesn't always work because you have to uh, be damn sure you're right. I mean, sometimes everybody is right, but generally it's not true that they're right. Generally, if you look at the total uh, – outlook on a company and if everybody sort is down on it that's one to look at thank you and my second question is what in your opinion these days do ceos need to do to be successful do they need more education experience industry knowledge i, I think i think the answer is I, I think the answer is that most of them have to have to leave the company <laughs> But to be a little more uh, to be a little more fair about it, uh, uh, the CEOs uh, of a lot of companies probably could do a good job, but um, they they they're more I into building up. Um, it's it's like the royal we, you know. It's more like the imperial CEO, and they build up a huge amount of people around them, and they very rarely get to the nub of the problem. And some of them are probably okay, They're probably good guys, but but there's no accountability. It's like you go to school and if you never have tests and nobody ever bothers you, and that's what really happens until they really hit the bad times. And uh, and I guess you could say I, I'm a bad time when I come in. They don't like it too much, you know. But uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, I think that the problem we have today is – very simplistically, you don't have true elections. So you can't, it's very hard to get rid of the CEO, even though you theoretically have a vote. It's very hard to use the vote. I mean, you imagine in a political race that the senator is fighting, the, the, the incumbent is, is fighting the, uh, for an election and he can take all the money out of Washington, he can take it out of the Treasury of the United States, and the other guy can't, you know. And, uh, it's completely it's completely set up and rigged for the, uh, the the CEO because anybody coming in to fight them they sue them to begin with you know they they sue you to they don't sue me anymore too much because they know I'm not going away but they 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 sue they do not let uh, let you have I, I I could go into all the different shark repellents you call them but um, it's it's very very difficult to beat one of these guys. I think that's going to change in the next four or five years. That's what I was telling you. And I think we're going to have a, a, a better corporate democracy, which gives people with real talent, who really with a work ethic, uh, a, a chance to really make it. Mr. Icon, as you've touched upon, we may be in the worst credit bubble in history currently. If you are right, the upcoming debt deflation will be long and painful. How will you recommend that investors protect their wealth during this period to take advantage of upcoming investment opportunities? Well, it's, it's hard to recommend uh, uh, how, how to invest at this time, I, you know, it, it, without knowing uh, how much capital you have. But, but I would be, uh, again, you know, I've been uh, – here at a different uh, arena, you know, we invest and we look for these opportunities now, but uh, I feel that uh, you have to be certainly very careful, right? You have to be very careful in your investment, uh, in your investments, even though the markets were going up the last few days, I would be careful and not have all your money invested in stocks. I would look at a lot of these uh, distressed debt, some of the distressed debt that has gone down. I don't know if you understand that, but some of the some of the debt, that, uh, even even bank debt, which is the highest level, uh, I think is is has become very cheap. So that kind of stuff is something to look at. But I'd be very uh, careful in buying equities. But I mean, I you certainly 
could make a fortune by them. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly not telling you it's not going to work, but uh, I, I think it's all risk reward and a lot of risk. I, I would be looking at this uh, at the debt areas. You mentioned um, about the U.S. dollar falling in value recently. What kind of uh, foreign currency vehicles or trading would you recommend to kind of hedge a bet against the dollar, assuming that it continues to fall? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know much about uh, uh, currencies, and I really don't get into something I don't know something about, or generally don't. So I don't play the currency market, unfortunately, because uh, the, the, that currency has gone down so much. And uh, I, I don't necessarily think that you should do that now, because uh, it could theoretically turn in this country. But I'm only saying that... Uh, that, that it has become one of the manifestations of our problem. The currency of, our, of the dollar has fallen. But, you know, you can't be that sanguine about everything in Asia either. Everybody loves Asia now and loves China and loves all these countries. But you could have some global problems too. So I don't know that it's time to rush out of the dollar, you know. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Icom. Um, one major criticism that um, CEO against um, corporate activists is that um, they think activists don't think long-term interests of the corporation. They just want to get money and get out. How do you answer to that? I would just uh, say that the, uh, that the facts don't bear that out as far as I'm concerned. I mean, if you, we, I own quite a few companies. Any company we, we got control of, I put literally hundreds of millions of dollars into them. I mean, I bought a company in 85, a rail car company. We put hundreds of millions. We still have the fleet. I, I, uh, I kept the, I bought casinos and uh, energy companies and over the years kept them, sold them now, but that's after 10 years. So any company that we've been able to get control of, uh, I actually kept because getting control is a great thing. And if you, if you really believe the management's not doing well, you can go and clean them up and put a good guy in. So we're, we, we, I don't. I, I know they criticize you like that, but that's uh, part of the propaganda machine. It's just not the facts. Um, a related question is that: um, What do you do when your um, um, activist spirit is not appreciated, as in the case of Motorola, when you ask for a seat in the board but just get declined? And what, what, what's your next step? All right. You, you, you have you, you have uh, you have uh, patience, and now it was a year later, and we'll see what happens now. But uh, Motorola is a good example of what I'm talking about. People don't like it; they don't like the uh, cell phone business. But uh, I really think that that business, if you look at Motorola and study it, you're buying that whole business for nothing. If it's not reflected in the stock price, and but. They have to do it. I said it publicly is take that business out of Motorola, spin it off and give it to the shareholders. And I think then you've got a real good value. So what I'm saying is nobody likes it now, but hopefully I'm correct on that. And I really think by being an activist and, and, and putting pressure on that board that has done nothing really, that I think eventually that will happen. Hopefully. Maybe we'll have uh, one or two more questions. Two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Mr. Icon, why does the United States have bad corporate governance, and which countries have better models? All right. Uh, we, we have bad corporate governance. It's evolved into this. I, I don't think that Washington understands how bad it is. Nobody's really focused on it. The different states, the way we're structured, the different states want corporations uh, to, to register it. And therefore, they, the rules are such that they protect the corporation with the poison pills. And I can't get into all these different things, staggered boards, poison pills. And I think if you just change some of that, we could be like, for instance, England is much better. Canada has much better where you can, without getting into detail and simplify this, where you can have pure elections. And the United States, because of the way they're structured in the states, you know, the division between the 
federal and the state government, they have not been able to really curtail some of the abuses, but I think it will occur sooner or later, especially if you have a bad recession. Hi, Mr. Icon. You mentioned that you believe that many companies are poorly managed. Obviously, you don't invest in every company. So I was wondering what factors you look for in identifying companies that you want to invest in and that you think are especially poorly managed. Okay, we look at a lot of companies. Obviously, I have a whole group of people here that do that. And I have a bunch of lawyers that look at all the covenants in these companies and their bylaws and their charters. But really, uh, some of them... Uh, uh, become very apparent, a and when you look at them, you can you can understand, and you have to see that in in relation to the economy. But some of these companies, uh, uh, it's just apparent that uh, the value of these companies would be much better if if they were if they were better run, or well, they just simply did certain things by you know by breaking like in like Motorola's example, they just broke it up, or you, you know. And, and in some biotech companies that we're involved in now, there's a need for them by the big pharma. You know, big pharma hasn't really done research for years of any of any merit in the biotech area. And therefore, uh, biotech companies aren't that well run, but they do. They have spent a great deal in research for, you know, uh, the large molecule uh, uh, drugs. And, and, and so therefore, uh, uh, you look at these, and yet some of them become quite apparent after doing them for the years and years I've done them. A, a lot of them, it's almost, after you do all the work, it's almost instinct, you know? Uh, the risk of being a modest is asking, uh, it's, it's like asking some real great tennis player, well, why did you move here instead of there? Or a football player, you know, when you're running down the field, why did you go to this way instead of that way when you're, when you're running down the field? And I don't think you can tell you. It's just sort of an instinct why you do it. But that's after a lot of work on it. Well, I think this has been a very uh, enlightening talk. Uh, and Carl, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for having me.